Hello, all Eorzeans and fellow warriors of light. The time has come for us to discuss the upcoming expansion of 5.0 Shadowbringers. Now, I've given this a lot of thought. I've done a lot of research trying to piece all the pieces together. And I think I might have a reasonable prediction to what I think is going to be coming for us in both 4.5 and at least somewhat for Shadowbringers. We still don't know that much about Shadowbringers because we only have the one trailer so far. We do have some information, but we are also still waiting for 4.5 parts 1 and 2 to come out. So this is my best predictions to what I think is going to be waiting for us, what we can be expecting. And there's a good chance that it's all completely wrong and things are going to be changing very quickly into a whole other direction, but that's okay. That's what makes it fun. So, like I said, these are just my own personal opinions, my own guesses to what's coming. I'm first going to start off with a summary of the Shadowbringers trailer that we've seen. Okay, so first the summary of everything we saw, and then we'll get to the predictions. First off, we start off in the trailer in this wasteland area. We don't know where we are or how we got here. But we do have all this golden light emanating from the clouds above us. And we have a few pools of water, some crystals jutting out of the land, and even a few trees and flowering shrubs in the distance. I mean, apart from the plants, it looks like we might be the only living creatures around here. And when we look to the ground, it does remind me a little bit like coral, perhaps? At first I thought that it was a piece of like Western Lenotia. Well, almost anyway. But next we move on to the overshot view of the Warrior of Light staggering across this land completely alone. And then we turn to a first person view of him. And we see them just staring at the ground, gasping for air, having a hard time walking. And that's when we go to a lower shot of them where we see them in the armor that they were wearing back in 1.0, like the original Final Fantasy XIV game. He's also carrying a bow, you can see the quiver of arrows on his back. And then we go up to his face where we see that this is a warrior of light that's grown much older. He looks much more exhausted and battered. At this point, we know that the warrior of light has been through hell and back through all the events of the game. And we see that even more clearly when we're given these flashbacks of events that took place in 1.0. Like we have Bahamut roaring, we have Dalamut falling from the sky before breaking apart and raining devastation down upon the land. He's holding his hand to his head, we see he's in a lot of pain, we see more visions of the past games racing through their minds. Then we cut back to the Warrior of Light again, who's staggering, he's almost falling over, and it's clearly just a struggle for him just to remain upright. And going back through these visions, we have like the image of the Crystal Tower image, we are sliding right through on the Steps of Faith where we have dragons raining fire down on us, we have the Warrior of Light meditating on Ralgar's palm back at the Reach, we're gearing up in like Dragoon armor, ready to defend Ishgard from the Horde, and Kugane attacking the guard and destroying half the streets, limping across the frozen wasteland after fleeing Udal. We even have a scene way back in 1.0 where we witness the Battle of Silver Tear Falls where Midgardsummer brings down the Agrius. And basically back when they first started, like they first started off as an adventurer and like their first battle against this giant Morble. So I thought that was really nice that we go back to all of the previous games and we just really see just how much that our character has been put through. Now after seeing all of this, it's clear that the many battles are really taking their toll on the Warrior of Light. It's having like a serious effect on their mental well-being. And then we have like a sort of another vision and the Warrior of Light is kind of blacks out here. We are cut to a flying overhead shot of what appears to be a war ground, like a huge battlefield. We see death and ruin everywhere as fire is burning, the sky is pitch black with smoke and ash. Yeah. We see the remains of both Magitek and people just lying everywhere. Suddenly we tilt up and we look to see the six banners, each of a different color and symbols representing the six United Nations of Eorzea. We have Limsa, Gridania, Udal, Ishgard, Alamigo, and even Doma. They're all set up on this hill on one side of the battlefield. We see fire burning around them, this wind is blowing really strong, and we see more bodies and the remains of Magitek just surrounding the banners. 
while on the other side of the battleground, we have the lone banner of Garlemald. It's flapping about wildly, and this is signaling that we are in a fight for our lives against the Empire. And from the looks of things, this battle is not going well for either side. Suddenly, we shift, so we're not just watching the battlefield, we're seeing the Warrior of Light standing there fighting on the field. He's back in his samurai gear from Stormblood. We see him having just cut down another Guardian foe. And he is a mess here. His clothes are dirty, they're torn, he's covered with blood and dirt. And you could just feel all the pain of everything he's seeing here weighed down in his face. And then all of a sudden we hear these words spoken. How many years have come and gone since that day? That's when the Warrior of Light looks up and we see what looks to be perhaps the only other surviving warrior on the battleground, who had just finished taking care of another soldier. Fires raging around him, we see the katana in his hands, and he turns around and we see the front view of Xenos. He's wearing that skull-like helm again, but we see that a part of it was broken off so we can see just a single eye looking back at us. That's when we hear the voice speak again. How many years have I waited for this moment? We see Xenos' eye narrow when he sees who it is, and we both prepare ourselves to fight once more. Both of them sheath their blades and prepare for one more battle. The two are glaring at each other, both waiting to see who will come out of this next attack alive. Meanwhile, we hear the voice speak again as we move to this wide shot of the two standing on either side of the battlefield. We see this water, like this tiny stream, like go in between the two, which is kind of representing the two opposite sides that they are fighting on. We see the sky above them covered in pitch dark clouds. They're surrounded by death on all sides as the voice speaks again. For the one who stood against the storm. A nearby burning banner falls over and into the water just as they charge at the same time. They all but fly to each other and faster than blinking they charge past the other after having made contact. They now stand with their backs to each other waiting to see who won. Yet their blows were so great that the clouds in the heavens parted, revealing a night sky with a crescent moon and stars. While below them, at their feet, all the rock, shrapnel, and even the water are just blasted away from how powerful this attack was. So here they are, standing in like this perfect, empty circle, waiting to see who won. We don't know who wins yet as the shot turns back into a close-up of the Warrior of Light's eye, and the voice asks once more before it fades out, for the one they called the Warrior of Light. The image then fades so that we're back to the Warrior of Light in this barren wasteland once again, and they're trying to recover from what they saw, whether it be from a past battle that they experienced or it's like a vision of the future. Suddenly we hear another voice speak, but it's not the same voice that we heard before. It's a hissing, disturbing, like, a voice that we don't even recognize. We have to have subtitles speak for us just so that we can understand what they're saying. It says, Weary Wanderer. And then we turn and we see like this little gremlin with white fur and large pointed ears looking up at us. And he starts laughing, revealing like his sharp teeth and red eyes as he taunts, No fight left to fight. He cackles some more and then adds, No life left to live. Now the Warrior of Light is gritting his teeth, resisting his taunts, and then everything around them is just bathed in this golden light. And we look up to the clouds to where the light's coming from, and we see these white feathers starting to fall around us. As the little gremlin laughs, Ho, oh, it comes, the end, your end. And through these clouds and heavenly light, we see a majestic winged creature flying towards us. A giant angel-like figure breaking through the clouds, and we tilt back for this wide shot of the entire landscape. And we see just how broken and lifeless everything appears. We have the form of what appears to be a female with long white hair, glittering armor, and a shining sword, but with surprisingly dark eyes as it slashes at us with a blade. Now, in truth, we've actually fought this creature before in the lost city of Antipur, but I'll get to more of that in a moment. Here, the creature may have even recognized us for having defeated it before, because as soon as it sees us, it, you see their eyes widen, and they raises their sword, striking at us with a beam of light. The Warrior of Light sees this coming and holds up the bow to block it. But even though he survived the blast, it was still enough to send him flying backwards. We get this shot of his bow and his quiver of arrows being flung away from him and, and lay forgotten upon the destroyed land. 
As he is flying back, we see him transform into a warrior, and he flips over and digs the head of his axe into the ground, sliding himself to a stop. He then jumps up and runs ahead to face the creature, as we hear the gremlin yelling out behind us, Fool, who are you? No one. Nothing. Of course, the Warrior of Light refuses to listen as he swings up his axe. He's screaming out with fury as he charges ahead. And that's when we sort of cut to another scene, where we see two figures running up through some sort of dungeon-like area. We're racing up these stairs with what appears to be like a bright blue fire behind us and chains hanging everywhere. We see that the adult dressed in white and he has a small childlike figure that's robed and hooded with them as they're trying to get out of this place. We cut more to another scene of the dungeon where it looks like they're about to get out of here. The two stop as an enormous winged lion crashes in with a red crown upon its head. We turn back and we see that the adult in white turns out to be none other than Thancred and he has the child with them who appears to be female and moves back slightly as Thancred holds up his hand to try to protect her. That's when he says, this town certainly has changed, but not at all for the better. Then we see him go into what looks to be a gun blade on his back, ready to fight his way out. Suddenly, we cut back to the Warrior of Light, continuing his battle. He brought his axe against his foe's shield, only to see it shatter upon impact. With the broken axe flying about, the angel then knocks him back with a shield bash, before he shifts and is suddenly a dragoon again. He then jumps up and goes flying straight at it, where the angel dodges the blow, and soon the two of them are duking it out in midair. But as soon as he holds up his lance to block the sword, we see it shatter apart like glass. With the weapon destroyed, he's fallen back to the earth. But just before he hits the ground, he shifts over to Monk, and he flips over and lands in the dirt before even the broken edge of the lance hits the ground. The Warrior of Light then spins about, jumping up as the angel flies in, ready to continue the fight. When they meet head-on, we see his fist glowing brightly as he throws out everything he's got into this attack, and while the voiceover continues speaking, this tragedy, greater even than the seventh umbral calamity, must be undone. The Warrior of Light survives the blow, yet we see that he's pushed to his limits. He was brought to his knees and he's struggling to get back up as the angel stands right above him. He then shifts back to his battered samurai gear as he prepares to use his katana. But his attack failed. It barely scratched his foe before a large stone foot comes in through the dust and comes down upon him. He's flattened against the ground, now so tired he can't throw it off. That's when we hear the voice say again, If history must be unwritten, let it be unwritten. The angel looms overhead, its foot still keeping him pinned to the earth as it holds up its sword, ready to put an end to him. And in that moment, when the blade comes down, we see a surge of dark energy escaping, and suddenly, the angel's sword, hand, and even most of its arm was instantly obliterated from this power. We see the dark eyes widen in shock, and it stares at the massive greatsword in the Warrior of Light's hands. Suddenly, it explodes into a violent burst of power as the angel is seemingly destroyed in the attack. Become what you must, the voice says again as we do like this badass shot of spinning about, seeing the Warrior of Light in black spiked armor with the heavy sword over his shoulder and cloaked in darkness while the voice finishes by saying, Become the Warrior of Darkness. Wow, so that is a lot to read into this. That was a summary of everything that we saw, but now we are going in for the predictions. Again, these are my own personal thoughts and opinions. You are free to agree with them or to disagree. This is just what I think is going to be waiting for us so far. So until we've learned more, this is what I'm going to be believing in. Okay, so we're going to be starting off at the beginning where we see ourselves walking through these empty lands once again. Now, we know very little about this place. Is it some sort of post-apocalyptic world where we lost the fight? A lot of people in my free company believe that it's going to be the world of the first, that we somehow leave the world of Hydaelyn and we travel to the same world that the Warrior of Darkness came from. Now, if you remember, this was a world that was on the brink of being erased by light, until Menphilia said that she would go to that world and she would try to take all the excess light onto herself, like they were not going to let the world of the first fall to light if they could help it. So. Do I think that this is where we are? On one hand, yeah, I can kind of see that. I mean, the atmosphere at the very least makes me believe that we're in a place like that. But personally, I don't think that's the case. I mean, we haven't even been able to explore all of our own world, but we're suddenly being taken to another world. The only way I can really see us being teleported to another world is if 
this is kind of like a warning like somebody brings us there and they are showing us like this is what's going to happen if you allow light to overpower darkness like don't make the same mistakes that we did and then there's another theory going around that we are actually been taken to the future of the world of Hydaelyn and we see the outcome of our battle where we did end up winning as the warrior of light and our victory ended up tilting everything in Hydaelyn's favor thus creating a flood of light but perhaps this is also one of the places that's going to be covered in by those thick clouds that we see on the map like it's one of those areas that was completely destroyed when Golobal came marching in and took over. I mean, I could see that in any of these cases. I can honestly find myself believing that that's exactly where we are. But if I had to choose between these three, I would say that we're in the future, and I'll get to why I think that in a moment. Either way, we look to see the Warrior of Light's face, and we see that he is exhausted. We see that he's just been through all seven hells and back again, and he's still forced to keep going. After all that he's been through since the very beginning of the game, either you're a legacy player or not, has not been kind to him, and it is having a serious negative impact on him, both physically, emotionally, and even mentally. And this is shown clearly like when all those memories are playing out in his mind of his previous battle experiences, and he's just pushed himself too far this time. That's when we go back to the battlefield and we can assume that this is a battle that is going to be coming to us like in the future because we have all of those banners standing there including Alamigo and Doma, while Gollumal is standing on the other side completely alone. And from what we have seen so far, this is a battle that is not going to end well for anybody. However, to be honest, I think that we're going to be seeing this battle closer to 4.5. Now. We do know that we're going to be getting a new dungeon in 4.5, and while we didn't get any screenshots, we did get some artwork which look eerily similar to the battlefield that we saw before. Also, while we don't know much about the story yet, we did receive a couple screenshots for 4.5. We have this one being Maxima and Alize talking, and what appears to be Alamigo. And in the other one, we have Solas who's grinning like the Joker about to kill Batman. I'm guessing that somewhere on the borders of Alamigo and Gollumal territory, either Maxima was found by the Shinobi who were going around dropping rumors that Xenos is dead, or he willingly comes back to Alamigo to speak with us about what's happening inside those borders. Perhaps he discovered that the Emperor is about to rage war upon them once again and they have to get ready for the battle that's coming for them. And that would explain these two screenshots at the very least. So what I'm thinking is that this battle takes place sometime during 4.5 and that the forces of Gollumal have decided to try to retake Alamigo and suddenly a full war erupts between them. And we, the Warrior of Light, are going to be there to participate where we confront Xeno, or rather the Illidibus look-alike, and we clash once again. Also, I noticed that the katana that Yotsuyu had given Xenos before is at his side, so funnily enough, out of all the blades that he was carrying, it looks to be the only one that he still had. I'm not sure what that means yet though. But I also have another theory about when this battle is going to take place, but I'll get to that in a moment as well. Let's move back here to where we're back in this forgotten wilderness. I'm guessing that sometime during 4.5 we're called away again by the owner of the voice that we heard before in 4.4. In 4.4, we were mentally attacked by a stranger's voice. That way, sorrow. History must be changed. Ahead looms a calamity. Ahead looms light, expunging all form and life. Twin dooms only you can forestall. Only you. Let the expanse contract. Eon become instant. Throw wide the gates that we may pass. Now, it's clear that we are in for another calamity. It is just there upon the horizon and it's only going to be a matter of time until it comes. However, from what I gather, the person who was speaking to them in 4.4 is the same person who was speaking to us in the trailer. The voices sound the same to me, at least. So I think it's safe to say that whoever was speaking to them then is the same one who's speaking now. Now, if you listen to the voices side by side, then you realize that they do sound the same. And from what I heard, the voice actor in Japan for Alphanod it's the same person who voiced this mysterious voice in 4.4. And after listening to it, I guess I can see that as an older Alphanod's voice. So here's what I think. That 
where we are right here, this is truly the future, and that the Warrior of Light is somehow transported here by accident and is stumbling through it. That's when we meet the future Alphanod, who already knows everything that's about to happen to us, and he tells us that something horribly went wrong. The world was consumed by light. So now he's trying to warn them all that their actions are only going to make things worse, which makes sense as to why only the Scions could hear it. And when he uses the words, only you can forestall, I think he's speaking directly to the Warrior of Light because he really looks up to them. Like, I think the two of them have become, like, best friends, like, after everything they've been through. And he looks up to the Warrior of Light, he, he completely trusts the Warrior. And I think that even after everything that happened here, even after the end of the world, I think he still has that faith that the Warrior of Light is going to come through for them like they always do. But he knows that he has to at least warn them what's coming, otherwise the timeline isn't going to change. But if he can somehow get a message to the Warrior of Light before this tragedy happens, then he truly believes that they can find a way to change everything. What he meant by throw wide the gate so that they may pass, I'm not entirely sure yet. However, when I first watched the trailer, I first I thought that it was Xenos who was speaking to the Warrior of Light when he was asking how long he had been waiting for the chance to fight. But then I thought, that's not really Xenos now, it's Elidibus who's speaking. So maybe he's recalling his long life and of how many times he had to stand against a warrior of light throughout the years. But then they were speaking of the one who stood against the storm, and I think it's clear that they were talking about our character, the warrior of light. But not that much time had passed since we freed Alamigo and defeated Xenos. But here we have this voice asking us, like, how many years had he waited for this moment? So, I'm thinking that somehow, during this upcoming war with Gollumal, we pushed back the darkness so much that the light began to flood this world, but then something happened to the Warrior of Lights. They somehow disappeared or were pulled away, and we got zapped to the future somehow, where we met with the future Alphanod. And he's taking us around, like, this new barren landscape, and he's telling us exactly what happened, during like these eighth Umbro Calamity. So that's when I think that Alphanod, who somehow pulls us into the future, and, and somehow maybe we disappear or Hydaelyn pulls us away, like something happens to the Warrior of Light. So there is no one to prevent like all of this light flooding in. And, and Alphanod, he knows that something has to be done. So he found some way to go back in time or at least project his voice over time and space so that we can all hear him, like, the Scions can all hear his voice as he tries to tell them, like, to warn them what's going on. And eventually, he's able to find a way to pull their souls, like, into the future. Like, he's showing them everything that's happening. The only way we can prevent this future and a future on the opposite spectrum where darkness takes over is to become a warrior of darkness as well as a warrior of light. Now, let's go back to this little gremlin creature who's taunting and laughing at us. Now if you recall, we first meet these little gremlins in the lost city of Amdapur, where they are infamous for their tendency to insult their opponents with their bad mouth ability, leaving the target in a state of misery that increases damage taken, and we can only remove it by using the comfort emote. And that seems to be a bit of a theme here, because the winged angel is the and Karibu, the last boss from the Lost City of Amdapur hard mode, and the winged lion we see was the second boss. Speaking of which, let's go and talk about the winged lion and the scene here. We see Thancred running through this dungeon with a little kid at his side. Now, I had a few theories on who this person is. At first, I thought it was Yuna Kalhai, a minor character during the Warren Triad series that we met. But then I realized that the figure looks a lot more female. So then I thought, maybe it's Menophilia. Perhaps this really is taking place in the world of the first, and that something terrible happened. Maybe Hydaelyn is growing weak again, and is drawing strength from Menphilia, and she's just growing so weak that she's somehow getting younger. Which would explain why Thancred is risking his life there to protect her. Yet again, why would we go to the world of the first when we still have so many problems in our own world? No, as much as I like the idea of him risking his life from Menphilia, and being able to see her again, I think that this is a new character completely. As to where they are, at first I thought that it was Halati, one of the smaller side dungeons that we can do. 
Yet after getting a good look around, I realized how different it looks, so I'm guessing that this might be one of the new dungeons waiting for us in Shadowbringers. Which means, if nothing else, we know that Thancred does wake up from his slumber sometime between here and then. Though I also notice that he's no longer using his daggers, and instead using a sort of gun blade. I always felt that Thancred had some kind of connection to Garlemal, because he does seem strangely familiar with it, or at least he's able to sneak around like Garlene infested territory easily enough. And he did say that this place had changed, meaning that he had been there before. So while he isn't a pureblood Garlene, I think that it's reasonable to assume that he was born in the lands beyond Garlemal's borders. Perhaps he came from one of the lands that were conquered by Gollumal, and he somehow escaped to Eorzea when he was a child, where he lived on the streets. I actually have a friend in my free company who is so excited about this. Like, he started ranting and going on, like, we're going to be learning all about Thancred's past. Like, we're going to find out that he's some lost prince of Gollumal or something. Nice idea, but personally, I highly doubt it. As to who I think this little girl is... I think it's safe to say that she's going to be a very important character later on and that we're going to be meeting her sometime in Shadowbringers. Perhaps she is also a member of the royal line and she was opposed to this whole war and she was later imprisoned. Perhaps she was a friend of Thancred's. In some of the artwork we were shown, we see a dark figure riding a black horse carrying a small child bathed in white. So if we become the warrior of darkness, does that mean that we are the ones in black protecting this child? that this child is somehow really important to the plotline? I can't say for sure, but what I can say is that fighting the way we have up till now isn't going to be working anymore as we go on into the future. We have to grow stronger. We see the Warrior of Light back here battling with the uh, Kiribu, and we're just no match for it. I'm thinking that all of this is some sort of representation of the Warrior of Light's state of mind and of the upcoming danger. The gremlin is like our dark side telling us that we are no one, that we are going to lose this battle, and that we should just give up. We have to ignore it as we figure out a new way to fight. The Kiribu is a manifestation of the light that we are going to be battling against and has grown very strong because of all the battles that we have won. We are tired and weary, while the light is as strong and stubborn as stone. I remember someone once hypothesizing that this winged angel is actually like either Heidelin taking a new form or one of her servants coming here to destroy the Warrior of Light because we outlived our usefulness. I don't buy that. While I don't think that Zodiac is all evil and that Heidelin is all good, I don't believe that she would ever cast aside her champion like that. After all, she has risked her strength multiple times in keeping the Warrior of Light alive. However, her light has grown so strong now that it's threatening the world that she once sought to save, and our character can't keep up with it anymore. So, how do we battle the light? By becoming a warrior of darkness and to push it back. Okay, so to cap it up, I think that sometime during the 4.5, most likely in part 2, we're going to be called away by that voice again, which turns out to be Alphanod from the future, who already lived through the end of the world, and he's warning us of the dangers to come. And I think that it would be really cool if it turns out that while we are called away, like we have this out-of-body experience, we're stepping through time and the dungeon is actually a point in time that hasn't happened yet. But we are getting like a small taste of what's going to be waiting for us. And that's where we run through the battlefield, we meet with Xenos once more, that's where we meet with future Alphanod, and that's where he tells us like he was waiting and hoping for a chance to see us again, for we are the key to everything. We have the power to push back the light and the darkness. He believes that we can find a new way. He believes that we can do it, that it has to be us, only us, who can find the answer that the world needs. To prevent the war that is coming, we need to find a new path, and that involves risk. After we experience all of that, that's when we wake up back at the Rising Stones, like we see Alize there, like she's really upset because she thinks that we fell into like a deep slumber like the others. But as soon as we get back, that's when the other Scions start to wake up. At the very least, maybe Thancred wakes up and, and we come to believe that all of this is true, that these visions that we were having are really going to happen. 
after we meet up with Maxima and Alamigo and he warns us that shit is about to go down, that the Emperor is going to launch an attack against us and we don't stand a chance right now. So now the path is clear. We have to go to Gollumall and find a way to prevent the whole battle before it's too late. And that's when the Warrior of Light knows that they must learn to harness the power of darkness for the sake of the rest of the world. Whew, so that was a lot to take in. I know it's a little bit more about what I think is coming for 4.5, but again, it's really important for the plotline for Shadowbringers. I know that I'm guessing for most of this, and it's hard to try and come up with any solid theories after, after only having seen one trailer, but this was the best I could come up with, and I'm sure that I'm going to be swallowing my words and coming up with new theories in the upcoming month as we get more information. But I do hope that you enjoyed this video, if nothing else. Either way, I know that we're all going to be counting down the days until 4.5 and Shadowbringers all come out. I know that I'm going to be anyway. I hope that you're all enjoying your time in Eorzea, and I hope to somehow see you all, either in the Duty Finder, Party Finder, or running across Eureka and getting killed over and over again. I'm going to be doing more prediction videos in the upcoming days. I think that my next one will be another video on the jobs that we will be receiving. Since we can count Blue Mage out for Shadowbringers, I have to come up with what other jobs that we can be expecting. Hope you're looking forward to it, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.